Good morning and welcome to Rising. The Ukrainian delegation has arrived at the Ukrainian border for peace talks with Russia. President Zelensky said the two delegations will meet, quote, without preconditions at the border between Ukraine and Belarus. However, we are learning that dozens of people were killed this morning by Russian rockets that struck the city of Kharkiv. The deaths were confirmed by the Ukrainian Interior Ministry. Meanwhile, voters in Belarus approved reforms to allow the country to host nuclear weapons. Russian news agencies reported that a majority of citizens in Belarus, 65 percent, supported the amendment and will allow Russia to place nuclear weapons on its territory. President Zelensky has since pleaded for Ukraine to be given immediate EU membership in a video address over the weekend. Yesterday, Putin ordered Russian nuclear forces on high alert, citing aggressive statements by NATO and tough financial sanctions from the West, raising fears that the invasion of Ukraine could lead to an all-out nuclear war. In addition, Germany has said a fund of 100 billion euros, roughly $112.7 billion, will add to its armed services and will ramp up its defense spending above 2 percent of its GDP. Several European nations have since banned flights from Russia into the UK, Poland, Bulgaria, the Czech Republic, and more. Journalist Matty Morata has been on the ground with refugees fleeing from Ukraine and is here with us to discuss these developments and more. Welcome. Uh, thank you for having me, guys. Yeah, thank you for being here. And so can you t talk a little bit about your journey from Ukraine to where you are now in, in Poland? Of course. Uh, so on the morning of the invasion, uh, February 24th, I woke up uh, to the sound of air raid sirens in the city I was in, the western Ukrainian city of Lviv. Uh, I decided at that moment that escape would be necessary, um, and I went to uh, the train station, I went to the bus station, um, and I went to see if there was car hire available, if there was Uber available, if there was any way to get out. And unfortunately, none of those means were possible. And so the only way to get out of the country at that time was a westbound egress on foot. Uh, and so I began walking and I walked 74 kilometers on foot between Lviv and Medica, Poland, which was one of the exits uh, designated from Ukraine. Um, on, along the way, I passed many cars that were abandoned. I passed uh, many refugees who had been inside those cars, those refugees uh, were carrying everything they owned on their backs or in their arms. And there were many children and there were many elderly people. And the elderly people and the children were having a very difficult time getting along the road, especially at such a distance. That distance is difficult for even an able-bodied person. And for somebody so vulnerable, such as children and elderly people, it was heartbreakingly uh, horrific to try and see all these people trying to flee west. And there were hundreds of people doing this at the same time. And so uh, it, grow, it grew uh, much worse as we grew closer to the border, uh, given that there was a higher number, volu a higher volume of people um, and more people were struggling and people had no food, water, shelter, clothing or access to a toilet. And so all these people were suffering this terrible humanitarian disaster. And they continue to suffer today, by the way, because there are hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians who are fleeing on foot to Poland and other Western countries. Um, and so the things that I saw on this long walk is a humanitarian crisis that is ongoing and it's involving um, hundreds of thousands of people who are facing harsh winter weather with no food, water, or warm clothing. Wow, uh, just incredible and horrifying. You know, what, uh, what are the, what things did you, did you hear from, from them? As you were making this journey, and it, you know, there are, and it's on, is it ongoing? There, there are, is it getting? Are there even more uh, people trying to trying to get out of the country now that uh, now that the bombing has really ramped up, as far as we can tell? Uh, yeah, no, I heard a lot from the people uh, with whom I was traveling. I spoke with several. I made uh, contacts with several. Uh, people were generally afraid that they had to leave their homes, and they did not know when they would get, they would be back, so they didn't know what to pack uh, on their journey. Some of them carried only a backpack. Some of them carried large suitcases. Generally, they knew that their country was being invaded, but they didn't know details because there was also communications blackout, uh, given that we were in the countryside. So there was no uh, internet available. There was no self-service available. 
every all everyone knew that the country was being invaded. Nobody knew how badly it was being invaded. And so there was just this great fear from everybody and this great sense of panic about needing to get west as fast as possible. Uh, and I, and I, they didn't know. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, and I imagine a lot of fear for loved ones, family members who are staying behind and fighting, right? Because you know, able-bodied, the able-bodied men are supposed to stay and defend yes. defend the country according to the government, according to Zelensky's orders, correct? Yes, and that order came through uh, during the walk, in fact. Uh, about 10 kilometers from the border, um, a Ukrainian army patrol came by and they were announcing on loudspeakers and with megaphones uh, that all able-bodied men, well, all men actually, able-bodied or not, uh, between the ages of 18 and 60 had to come with them right now, uh, regardless of circumstance, regardless of whether they were a father, regardless of whether they were helping perhaps uh, another person cross the border, they had to go with the army at that moment. And so all these men uh, who made up about half the column, whether they be fathers, brothers, sons, helpers, uh, any man who was there, was suddenly pulled away from the column and forced to fight uh, in the Ukrainian army. They were conscripted on the spot. And so there was a great sense of panic and fear and anger toward the uh, Ukrainian soldiers who were who were pulling these men away as it happened. Um, and it caused an even greater sense of, of urgency and desperation among the people as they attempted to cross this border. And suddenly the caretakers and the family members whom they loved deeply were, were taken away almost without a goodbye. Um, and so half the family is now evacuating to Poland and then the other half is now being forced to go fight in the East. And it's just this terrible breaking up of families that is occurring all throughout Ukraine at this very moment. Uh, did they approach you? Assuming that you were uh, an 18 to 60 year old Ukrainian man, how did, how did that, what was that interaction like? So basically they checked passports at various places. And because I was not carrying a Ukrainian passport, I was allowed to pass in various places. Although there were a couple times uh, when there were soldiers who seemed to be less discriminating or more discriminating, um, where I tried to duck around or hide among people. Uh, but generally, I was not in fear for myself at all uh, because I was carrying a foreign passport. But again, I was one of the lucky ones to be carrying a foreign passport. I made, for example, a Ukrainian friend on the trip who I walked with for several hours who was not able to get through because he was pulled aside. Uh, his passport was checked and he was conscripted right there on the spot. Wow. And, and what's the the mood in you're in, in Krakow, Poland now, I understand. I, I believe you said that. Yes. And, you know what? Uh, is this is the city just kind of flooded, overrun with Ukrainian uh, refugees, and, and what's the mood right now? Krakow is not flooded and overrun at this time. Um, Przemysl, Poland, which is the initial refugee center, is the one that is uh, somewhat overrun. I was there two days ago. Um, it's 15 kilometers west of the border, mm -hmm. Przemysl, and uh, about two or three thousand refugees were there. I was there, but I hear that it's being by uh, 10 or 20,000 refugees now. Um, and so the population has just ballooned over there, and those refugees are being dispersed to other parts of Poland. Um, so there are services that are taking them there. The, the bus carrier Flix bus has uh, given free fares to uh, Polish refugees from Przemysl. Uh, there's a train um, network that is taking uh, refugees for free to other parts of Poland. And so right now the refugees are just dispersing throughout Poland. And uh, Krakow has seen it. not many of them, but in coming days, it can be expected that Krakow will see, will see thousands of more refugees, and many are already here, and I've spoken to several. When you read some of the Western interviews with people who've been inscripted into the Ukrainian army, most of them just say, you know, I'm, I'm, the quotes are just, I'm proud to be here you know, defending my country. Uh, what was the reaction before they were conscripted, you know, as, as people started to understand that that this is likely going to happen, was there a range where some people were like, you know what, fair enough, we're getting invaded, I'm going, I've got to do what I've got to do, and others didn't want to do it, or was it all kind of a uniform hostility to the idea? I mean, you've really hit the nail on the head there. There was a range. It was somewhat of a juxtaposition. Uh, about half the Ukrainian men that I met were to serve their country, so proud that they they uh, sort of with great excitement ran off uh, to to serve in the army, to fight in the army, and they told their family not to worry that they would be serving the Ukrainian army proudly. But then on the other hand, there were men who 
were pacifists who did not want to fight in the war, uh, understandably so, and who wanted to escape with their families and keep their families safe at any cost. Um, and they were very reluctant to go. And that's where you saw a lot of the anger and fear and desperation is when these men who just wanted to protect their families uh, did not want to go and the families would get in arguments with the soldiers who were oftentimes uh, not empathetic toward them. All right. It reminds me of, I was just reading recently about the, what, what, were, what was called the Black Army, which was the, you know, the anarchists in, in Ukraine from what the, you might know more about this from the 1917 till around 1919 fighting fighting off the Germans in Ukraine, and the anarchists even would conscript uh, people as they went village to village in, in Ukraine. Ukraine has one of the proudest and longest traditions of anarchism in the, in the world. Yes. And so if even anarchists are willing on, in desperate situations to conscript somebody into service, then certainly a, a standard government like this is going to do something like that. Did, yes, and so, yeah, did, 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 that, did, that, did that history kind of uh, how, how does that history inflect what's going on now? You know, I never heard anything about the anarchist history in particular. However, Ukrainian history does get invoked quite a bit. Uh, the Ukrainians, of course, are very proud to be an independent state. They only really gained their initial independence in 1918 uh, as the Western Ukrainian People's Republic. Um, and then that was quickly, of course, taken from them by... Uh, by years and years of occupation by um, various foreign powers, uh, first Nazi Germany, then the Soviet Union. And now finally, since 1992, uh, Ukraine is free again. And since 2014, especially, Ukraine is free again um, because they see themselves as having sort of a pre-Maidan and a post-Maidan mentality, Maidan being those protests that occurred in 2014 against the government. Um, and so Ukrainian history is deeply ingrained in all Ukrainians, whether it be the fierce independent uh, attitude of, say, the Western Ukrainian People's Republic in 1918 and the, anarchist, the anarchists, as you mentioned, during that period, or whether it be the people who fought for freedom from the Soviet Union in 1991-1992, or whether it be, even more recently, those who fought at Maidan and who gave their lives so that Ukraine can become a more independent and westernized state. Manny Morota, we can't thank you enough for joining us. Please stay safe. Thank you, guys. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll have more Ukraine coverage coming up next with our radars. Stay tuned.